started. All right. So the <clears throat> Myself, I unmuted myself. Can you not hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. All right. Perfect. All right. In addition to Dave Nordine, we will also have Mech Bowen, who is also on the Friends of the Viking Ship Board, to talk as well. So we will start with Dave, and I'll leave it to you, Dave. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, um, thank you very much for the flexibility on the part of the audience uh, for rescheduling this program and also putting up with the fact that I'm not there in the room with you today. Um, my wife and I just celebrated our 20th wedding anniversary, and we did so with a trip to uh, New Orleans, which turned out to me to be a trip to the big sneezy bear in the big easy. I caught COVID down there, which necessitated having to bump it from last week, and I'm still having an active infection. So uh, that's why I'm talking to you today on the big screen in front of you instead of standing in the room with you. But thank you very much. Uh, this is the first of several programs that the Friends of the Viking Ships can be putting on um, to sort of sketch out other interesting topics related to the big topic, which is, of course, uh, the gallery exhibit at the Geneva History Museum about the 1893 Viking ship. And I hope that you've all had a chance to, if not before today, then today, uh, go through that exhibit uh, because we put an awful lot of work into the exhibit. And, uh, well, there's a lot there to enjoy. So thank you for joining me here today. And uh, we'll go ahead and get rolling. So this program today is going to be about Viking women, um, which is a very interesting topic. After all, half the people in the Viking world were women. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting ones there. Uh, by way of basic uh, introduction, though, um, it's important for us to understand the limitations of what we know about both Viking mythology and about Viking history. Um, what we know about that <clears throat> comes from a compilation which took place in the 1200s uh, by a guy named Snorri Sturluson. And he compiled uh, the Poetic Eddas, which were 31 ancient poems uh, reported, recorded orally, uh, as well as uh, prose Eddas. This is compositions by Snorri himself uh, relying on uh, ancient uh, ancient uh, stories, but had been repeated only orally. And these stories themselves were not discovered until 1643. So we're talking about stories that are describing both mythology and history slash legend, uh, which took place seven, 900 years before they were first discovered in written form. Uh, so what we have is an inherently unreliable uh, information about both Norse mythology and about Norse history. Um, now, during the course of the presentation, I'll be using terms Norse and Viking. We should understand what those mean. Um, Norse refers to the language, culture, and the religion of the people of ancient Scandinavia. Uh, the term Vikings, uh, in its most narrow sense, refers to only those males of that civilization uh, who engaged in uh, raiding and traving in their famous Viking ships. But uh, the era that we're talking about specifically today, which is from around 700 to 1100 AD, we refer to as the Viking era because that was the era when the Vikings did their thing and had a profound influence on the rest of Norse culture. All right. It's important to understand that there was no Viking Homer, Cicero, Pliny, Tacitus. Uh, there was no catechism or guide created during the Norse period of time or during the Viking period of time, rather, to summarize their religion. Uh, rather, what we know about ancient Viking history and about Norse mythology uh, comes to us only from stories repeated from generation to generation until finally written down in the 1200s. Uh, and as a result, these stories are inherently sketchy. Um, we don't have a single place we can look to to understand what, what Norse culture was about or what the Norse religion was about, for that matter. Rather, we have a series of stories that we glean facts from to try to create an overall impression about Viking mythology. It's also important to understand that the stories were created for a somewhat limited audience. That is, uh, the recitation of oral stories 
were created to please the audience. And the audience that could afford to have people come and tell stories for a living uh, was generally the upper class people. And so the lifestyle, both of the gods as well as the historical characters the stories purport to talk about, um, tend to emphasize the personal characteristics of the leaders in the society. And they were exceptionally violent. And as a result, exceptional violence pervades uh, both Viking mythology and uh, Viking history slash legends. Uh, nevertheless, they're very interesting. And so we go through them, uh, try to pick out details to create a generalization about what Viking culture, what Viking religion, and what, what Viking period history was all about. And indeed it was one uh, of some very unusual and unusually powerful women, which makes her an excellent topic for Women's History Month uh, to accompany the 1893 Viking ship display. Um, and the power of women in Viking culture is not only in the same rather magical power that they bear in all cultures, the ability to bear children, therefore to create a future, uh, but in power in overall aspects of life. And some of them are downright bizarre. Uh, for example, we'll start with the Norse creation myth, uh, which starts with a female, not a male. And the female is Althumbla the cow. Um, the Jotun or giant Aramir, the first giant, drinks from gigantic rivers of milk that flow from her udders. Aramir, whose name means screamer, is a hermaphrodite. Uh, he can give birth without mating. In the meantime, uh, while she's providing lots of milk for Aramir the giant to drink, um, she licks a salt block, gradually revealing Burry, who's in the salt block, He's the grandfather of the gods Odin, Veoli, and Ve. They end up murdering Aramir, the giant, making oceans from his blood, soil from his skin, plants from his hair, clouds from his brains, and the sky is the inside of his skull. Uh, the three original gods, Odin, Veoli, and Ve, then make four dwarves, whose names are Austi, Vestri, Nordri, and Sudri, north, south, east, and west, right? And these four dwarves, hold up the four corners of the skull, keeping the sky up in place. How's that for a start? Anyway, um, so then the first people are created, uh, Ask, whose name means ash tree, that's the first man, and Embla, uh, whose name means elm or vine. Uh, and then the gods create a world, Midgard, and they place that world as one of the nine worlds into the roots and branches of the gigantic tree Erdrasil, the tree of the entire cosmos. So the Norse creator god in the first in the first instance is a female and a cow. Uh, the program today is going to cover some very powerful women of Norse mythology, then powerful women of Viking legend and history, then some formerly powerful but definitely real excavated Viking women, and then everyday life for Viking women. And then finally, we have a presentation from a real live woman, Methy Bowman, one of our board members, uh, who's going to be talking about some of the traditions of ancient Vikings, which still persist today in traditional Viking female garb, rather not Viking, but Norwegian garb. So we'll begin with the most powerful beings in the cosmos, the Norns. Uh, the Norns are more powerful than the gods, because the gods, despite their great power and long life in mythology, have births and deaths but not the Norns. They're always there. Are there any gardeners in the audience today? Any gardeners today? Raise your hand if you're a gardener. Gardener. Any gardeners here? No. Not a surprise. Not a surprise. Um, <clears throat> apparently, the Vikings or the Norse thought that there was something inherently, uh, an inherent drive that women possessed to nurture things. And the Norns have, have just two activities. So the first of them is to water the roots of the gigantic tree Erdrasil in which all other worlds depend, right? Nobody assigned this job to them. They just instinctively understand it needs to be done. They're gardeners. Uh, and these three Norn sisters are named Erd, Verdandi, and Skull. You may have heard those words around. That's where they come from. They're the names of the Norns. And aside from the jars, which they use to water the tree of life, Erdrasil, they are also described <clears throat> as holding a spindle. And we were trained to the spindle a lot when we talk about Norse mythology. Um, every female in Viking culture 
spent a lot of time with the spindle because that's how you made fabric from which clothing were made. And that was a principal activity of all women was to create yarn or thread from a spindle. And they have a spindle as well, but they use it for a far more powerful purpose than weaving cloth. That's the second of their jobs. The second of their jobs is to visit all newborns of all beings, being giants, gores, dwarves, gods, elves, every human from the greatest of rulers to the most insignificant of slaves and decide among themselves how long a strand of life each of those beings is going to have in their time. In other words, the Norns create your fate. And for a culture which valued risk taking as the Vikings clearly did, uh, there's both intimidation and confidence that comes from this fact because it meant that no matter how great a risk you undertook, how dangerous an enterprise you'd undertake, if it wasn't your time, it wasn't your time and you were invulnerable. And of course the converse is true. If it was your time, nothing could save you. But in the meantime, go for it because if it's not your time, you'll be fine. And you can't pray to the Norns, you can't ask them, you can't negotiate with them. Rather, the three of these women decide among themselves what your strand is going to be, and their power is absolute. Next, we come to Frigg, the wife of Odin. Now, she's a member, they're all a member of the Aesir, the highest ranking beings in the universe. Uh, they're the gods. And she is often depicted also carrying a spindle. After all, as a dutiful wife, her job is to provide clothing for the household. Uh, except she spins the cloth for the clothing of the gods from the clouds themselves, high class stuff. She's also given credit for uh, uh, being a god, a deity you can pray to uh, for assistance with pregnancy or fertility. Uh, and she also is a just a generally dutiful goddess, but you can you can appeal to her, you can talk to her. She cares many of the qualities, including the ability to discern the future and a certain independence in the choice of her lovers, because uh, like, like gods of other civilizations, she's not particularly faithful. She has a very similar name to another Norse goddess, Freya. And for a long time, uh, people who study mythology have tried to distinguish between these two, but the current thought is that they probably are the same goddess. That is Frigg, the wife of Odin, and Freya, the goddess of fertility, are really are the same goddess and they descend from an earlier Germanic goddess. And just because of the repetition of stories by different people from different time periods over a long period of time, um, they came to appear to be different people. But in fact, today, the general fertility, the general idea is that they are the, one of the same goddess. And in any event, they gave their name to Friday. Um, Freya is a very important person because um, although you probably have all heard of Valhalla, the place that war brave warriors go if they get killed in combat, uh, run by Odin, in fact, half of those who die in war uh, don't go to Odin, they go to Freya. And her realm is just as valuable as that as run by Odin. It's just a different place. It's in a, in a, a different level of Viking heaven. Um, and, but they're just as valiant as the ones who end up with Odin. So they're gonna end up in the same battle at the end of time as well. Uh, but it's important to understand that half of those who die valiant in battle don't go to Odin, they go instead to Freya. Next, we all go to hell. That is the goddess hell. And she is also extraordinarily powerful. Um, she's stern, severe to ordinary mortals, uncompromising. She has all the warmth of one of Putin's jail guards perhaps. Uh, she's the ruler of the realm called hell. And this is the cold, lonely, misty realm on the underworld edge of the world of ice, Niflheim. This is the realm to those who have chosen to live a life of safety, that is one where they die by death or disease, are condemned. It's a cold, lonely realm where the only thought is how you wish you'd done more with your life. 
Uh, but Odin has ordered hell to provide housing for those dead who were cursed to an inglorious death and an undiscriminated reputation after their life. And uh, as stern as she is, and not a very pleasant thing to look at either, she's half beautiful woman and half a kind of a blue color decomposing corpse. Uh, she's the best of the, uh, the offspring of her father, who's Loki. Loki is the Viking trickster god. Um, the other children that Loki had by marriage, uh, aside from hell, was the horrifying world serpent, the Jormungand, who swims around in the world sea that surrounds the world, and Fenrir, the gigantic wolf who's going to end up consuming the sun at the end of time. Loki, by the way, uh, has other undesirable characteristics besides producing unpleasant children. Um, <clears throat> he also has one other child, and that's Odin's eight-legged horse, Slepnir, which he conceived by turning himself into a mare and breeding with a giant. This resulted in the eight-legged offspring horse, Slepnir. Next in the realm of powerful Viking goddesses or, uh, is, are the Valkyries, and their name means the choosers of the slain. They have enormous power because they're going to determine your reputation uh, after your life. Um, although the length of your life has already been determined by the Norns, what you're doing at that last moment is up to you. And if you've been wise enough to live in such a way that you will die in battle valiantly, you will find yourself being forced to taken off to Valhall or uh, off to the realm presided over by Freya. And the Valkyries, like other powerful women, can marry or not as they choose to do. They generally choose not to get married, but it was no dishonor to a Valkyrie to be unmarried. There is one tale told of a picker Valkyrie whose name is Sigurdfa. She uh, carelessly picks the wrong person to die in battle and Odin is displeased with her choice. As a punishment, he then orders her to get married, but she defies Odin. She says that she's already taking a vow to never marry a man who has ever known fear. Since every man has known fear in his life, there's simply no one worthy of her anywhere in the universe. But at any rate, she defies Odin, even though she made a bad choice on the battlefield. Valkyries are often depicted um, in artistic convention uh, as holding a cup to greet valiant warriors as they're descending or as they're ascending up to Valhall or to the realm of Freya. Uh, and here's a, a replica in silver of a representation of a Valkyrie, which was excavated in a famous site uh, near Stockholm called Birka. Uh, the Birka was a very important commercial site for the Viking. It's also a site of some 3000 Viking period graves. It's yielded a huge trove of fascinating objects, uh, including this beautiful silver replica of a Valkyrie holding a mead cup in her hand to greet a warrior arriving in Valhalla. All right, now we'll move on to some, oh, just a minute, I have a, an advertiser that popped in front of my screen. Let me get rid of that. <laughs> Boy, I hate that stuff. All right, now we'll move on to some famous Viking women of Viking legend slash history. Understand and remember that all Viking history has an element of legend, if not the supernatural in it. And we'll start with the famous movie star currently, Lagertha, one of the heroes of the Viking a cable TV show that's just finished. Um, we know what we know about Lagertha because she was mentioned first by a Danish Christian historian named Saxo, who wrote in the 1100s. Now, this is some 300 years after the period of time when she supposedly lived. That's the mid 800s. As the story goes, there was a king in Sweden um, who invaded and killed the Norwegian king. And the Swedish king then uh, put all of the women in the dead king's family, which included Lagertha, into a brothel to humiliate them. The Danish hero Ragnar Lothbrok then came to the rescue. Lagertha, dressed as a man thereafter, took up the sword to take her own vengeance. Impressed with her martial skill, uh, Ragnar Brothmik married her for a while and had three children with her. And then he divorced her to marry a princess. However, Lagertha, ever faithful to Ragnar Rothbrook, um, and being a ferocious fighter, led a fleet of 120 Viking ships to come help Ragnar Rothbrook in a civil war he was engaged in down in Denmark. Uh, during the climatic battle, 
she supposedly took flight, that is literally took flight as in wings, and flew around to the rear of the enemy, pinning them in and allowing Rath, uh, Ragnar, Rock, Ragnar Lothric's forces then to slaughter their enemies. Once the battle is over, she, uh, in the meantime, she is remarried. She returns back to Norway, where she murders her own husband with a, a, a spear blade concealed inside her clothing, and then takes over running his kingdom for him because she figured she'd do a better job than him. Now, with fireside folklore like that, who needs history, right? But anyway, that's the story per the sagas of the famous Lagertha. Next comes all the deep-minded. And uh, she, if she did live, she lived between about 834 and around 900 AD, which is the period of time both the Viking settlement of, of uh, Ireland and also the Viking settlement of Iceland. Uh, during her life, she married the ruler of Dublin, which was a city founded by the Vikings themselves in 841 AD. Uh, and all the deep-minded was the daughter of the ruler of the Hebrides Islands, another uh, area that was colonized <coughs> by Norwegian Vikings. Um, however, on the death of her husband, her future was uncertain. After all, this is a time period when people readily grab power from each other. So taking charge of her own destiny, she ordered an ocean-going Viking ship secretly built into the forest. Then she commanded that with a crew of 20 sailors, as well as a group of slaves, and eventually made her way to Iceland. Now, because she was a Christian, she's also given credit in Icelandic folkloric history for introducing the new Christian faith to the just established Viking settlement in Iceland around the year 870 AD. Uh, slightly more reliable in the stories of all the deep-minded and uh, Lagertha um, are stories about some famous Viking women who lived some 230 years later. And we think that because these stories are 200 years newer, there may be more reliable elements in them. And the first of these is about the famous Freydis Erikstadter. Now, Freydis is the, in one saga, the sister, another saga, the half sister of the famous Leif Erikson. Uh, however, she's certainly a chip off the old block in terms of being a descendant of her father, who was Eric the Red, a true Viking. At any rate, um, in one of the sagas, uh, she's in charge of creating a joint expedition of Icelanders and Greenlanders uh, to the new colony in the new world founded by her brother, Leif Erikson, in the new colony called Vinland. So she puts together this joint profit sharing expedition. They're gonna split the profits equally of Greenlanders and Icelanders. However, she gets into a fight with the Icelanders over occupying the buildings her brother had built and left. So she lies to her husband and tells him that two of the Icelanders had beaten her up and she demands that he go kill the Icelanders, telling him he'll be a coward if he doesn't avenge her by doing that. So in obedience to his wife, her husband organizes the Greenlanders and they kill all the Icelandic men, but they spare the five Icelandic women in the group. Now, this enrages Freydis, and maybe she's a little bit jealous of what the Greenlanders plan to do with these women now that their husbands are dead. So she grabs an ax herself and kills the five women herself to solve the problem. In Eric the Red Saga, the other saga which describes Freydis, um, she's in command of the colony when a group of Native American warriors attack the colony. And the Native Americans are using slings to hurl stones. This is a weapon unfamiliar to the Vikings, but which uh, archaeologists independently determined that, in fact, um, the ancient Native Americans uh, in the Greenland area did use. At any rate, so somewhat uh, perturbed by this new weapon system they don't understand, the Viking men begin to fall back. Now, once again, furious, and in this story, eight months pregnant, Freydis grabs a sword from a dead Viking, uh, undoes the brooch on her outer dress, to let her breast fall forward, and then beats on the breast with the sword, both humiliating and intimidating both the Native American men and Native American women, who then withdraw from the fight. <laughs> Tough. And then finally, a calmer finish to this section on Viking legendary women, uh, Gudrid Torbjarnadotter. Uh, she is uh, a, an up, a upper class Icelandic woman, and she is for a period of time married to Leif Erikson's brother, Thorstein Erikson. He dies, 
as everybody seems to do in these stories. But he briefly rises from the dead to tell her that she's going to build the first church in Greenland. Well, she remarries a respectable merchant named Thorfinn Karlsefni and accompanies him while pregnant on an ocean voyage of exploration to Canada. Um, and while in the New World, in Canada, she gives birth to Snorri Thorfinnsson. So Snorri Thorfinnsson is the first European person of European descent to be born in the Western Hemisphere. Um, later, Thorfinn, like everybody else, dies. But Snorri's around, and Snorri, with his wife and his now aged mother, makes a trip to Rome, where they may visit the Pope. She then returns back to Greenland, and in fulfillment of the prophecy, does build the first church in Greenland, and spends the rest of her days living her life out as a nun. All right, now there's some posters in the front of the room there. Um, and I want you to direct your attention to the poster that shows the front of a very elaborate looking Viking ship. Um, there are three Viking ships in the Oslo Viking Ship Museum. Uh, the first of them is called the Tunis ship. It was discovered in 1868 and it was inexpertly excavated uh, with the result that whatever was inside there was exposed to oxygen and rotted away. So if there had been someone buried inside there, we're not able to determine who it was, and there are no grave goods either found with that ship. However, um, the bottom half of the ship did survive, and it has been, re has been reassembled in the Oslo Viking Ship Museum. Uh, the next ship discovered was the famous Gokstad ship, the one found in 1880, and that's the ship on which our 1893 Viking ship was patterned. A very, very close copy. And this is a somewhat more complete grave. Um, it, it did contain a, a grave of a Viking, high ranking Viking, the king perhaps, but certainly at the very least a Jarl. Um, and he had been a combat veteran. There's lots of combat injury to his legs shown in the excavation. And there's also uh, some uh, grave goods that were found inside the Gokstad ship as well. But far and away, the most spectacular Viking ship ever found is the one that you have on the poster in front of you. And that's the famous Osseberg ship that was discovered in 1903 and excavated in 1894. And take a look at the incredibly beautiful ornate carving along the bow of that ship. It also is an extraordinarily rich find um, because of the quality of the, and the quantity of the grave goods found with it, the tapestries. Uh, but most distinctive of all of this burial was the fact that the two persons buried in this were women. Uh, and they were both female, uh, as women tend to be, I suppose, of one in the 50s, another in her 70s. Um, and it was originally thought that the older of the two was the grandmother of the first king of all Norway. It was obviously a very high status burial. Trouble is that later carbon-14 dating showed that, in fact, the dates didn't match up, that that older woman in there, who was actually closer to 80 when she died, um, could not have been the grandmother of the first king of all Norway. Um, and then in the 20th century, uh, further excavation and scientific analysis of the bones revealed something even more dramatic. Uh, not only was the older of the women um, of high status, uh, she had died of cancer but she also had a rare condition known as Morganyi's syndrome. And this results in a dramatic overproduction of testosterone. And as the disease mechanism progresses, the victim develops thicker bones, deeper voice, stronger muscles, and eventually even grows a beard. <laughs> in other words, the older of these two burial women had a body that literally changed from that into a man before the presence of people who had a chance to keep her under observation. Um, and it's now believed that rather than being buried in this exceptionally rich grave uh, because of high social status, she may have been regarded as a kind of a goddess or a sorceress to be able to file the most basic of natural laws, that of gender. And it may have been that people at the time believed that she was a shapeshifter, like Loki, remember, who turned himself into a female horse to give birth to Slepnir. 
She also was buried in the same bed with the 50 year old skeleton. Where they were a couple is of course unknown today, but couple burials between husbands and wives did take place in the Viking era. So they may in fact have been a couple, but one thing was for sure, it must have been a truly mind blowing experience for those who knew her to observe the transportation before their very eyes of a woman into a man. All right, <clears throat> now let's take a look at the other poster you have in front of you. Um, this is a poster of an actual grave of one of the many discovered on the island or the settlement on Birka, which I talked about earlier. Um, Birka was established in the mid 700s and was occupied in the mid 900s. So as you say, about 200 years of occupation. There is some 3000 graves on Birka and over a thousand of those have been excavated. By far and away, the most common artifact found in these female graves are spindles, a virtual symbol of Viking femininity. But about 15 of those graves of women contain weapons. And the one that's shown out here on the, scribe, on the screen is the most spectacular of all of them, where there is nothing but weapons inside this female grave, as well as uh, the skeletons of two horses that were buried along with her. Now, uh, this particular uh, grave has gotten a lot of attention because of the fact it was first discovered, it was believed to be the grave of a high ranking warrior, soon to be a man. And uh, you know, the question of gender fluidity being such a hot topic today, this particular grave has gotten a lot of attention. Um, we have no idea how widespread it was for females to fight as men. We do know it did take place. Um, just because of the fact we do have these weapons found in other female graves. Um, and it's not entirely illogical as well because of the circumstances of Viking warfare, which is not always against the outside world, it was sometimes fjord against fjord. And I suppose common sense tells us that in certain circumstances, uh, women would have attempted to defend their household against a, against a raid coming from a competing fjord next door. At any rate, um, this is a very, very dramatic and very well-known grave because of the fact that it's purely a warrior's grave containing only the highest, uh, highest quality weapons inside this grave. But what about the life of real, ordinary, everyday Viking women? What was that like? Well, let's take a look at that mannequin which you have standing in the room there in front of you. The one without the head, but with the dress. And in the corner of the room there, it's the... Uh, She's got a blue underdress on and kind of a, a maroon colored outside dress. Who is she? What does this tell us? Well, remember, she's growing up. She has, has grown up in this world where stories are being told about extraordinarily powerful Viking goddesses and powerful Viking women. Um, and in fact, it is true that in the Viking women uh, in the Viking era, we're talking about this time period, um, had much greater status and independence than in the Catholic Christian countries. Um, in those countries, arranged marriages have been normal, and arranged marriages are normal in Scandinavia as well. But uh, as a result of the influence of Christianity in those countries, um, a, a bit at a time, women were moving into the background, right? Um, the Catholic Church in the pre-1000 era uh, was an exclusively male-dominant religious hierarchy. Um, and of course, the religion itself begins with a male creator god, and a celibate male savior. So it stands in dramatic contrast with what the Viking world was used to. Um, but it wasn't just mythology that affected the way Viking women as well. It was the practical aspects of Viking life. Uh, Scandinavia in the Viking era was a, a thinly populated area and geography often created separations from people, right? The fjords in Norway, uh, the numerous islands in Sweden and in Denmark um, created uh, independence. And this was exacerbated or, 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 or even emphasized when, um, because of the Viking raiding and trading lifestyle. You know, in other places, generally, as we all know, around the world, farmers are pretty stubborn people, right? They make all the decisions affecting all the living things on their farms. But peculiarly in the Viking world, um, men would leave the family, leave their farms, leave their fisheries, uh, leave their shops for periods of time to go on raids 
And this created a situation where Viking women were left in charge of the entire operation for the months at a time that a man was gone on a raid or a trading expedition. And so it became natural um, for women in the Viking world to be accustomed to a far greater degree of responsibility and decision-making than took place elsewhere in the European world of the time period. <clears throat> also take a look at the beads and brooches she has displayed on her chest. Um, these are the results of uh, successful raiding and trading uh, by her husband, which he's brought back and presented these to her. Um, and uh, of course, you know, happy wife makes for a happy life, which makes for more raiding and trading next year to bring more of this stuff back. Um, raiding and trading also brought into Scandinavia much needed currency. Uh, there was not much in the way of precious metal in Scandinavia and raiding and trading brought gold and silver uh, back into the into the Scandinavia, uh, which dramatically improved the quality of life in Scandinavia by allowing for then a medium of exchange to exist uh, to be able to access a larger variety of high quality imported goods. Now, as elsewhere in Europe in this time period, uh, marriages were primarily arranged by your parents um, in consultation, of course, with the uh, with the couple. But uh, marriages were arranged for the planned mutual benefit and advancement of both families. So it was a family decision, not an individual decision. And dutiful sons and daughters were expected to go along with the planning by their families. Uh, however, um, refusals did take place. However, refusal could be viewed as a great offense, however, when so much planning went into a marriage. And refusing to marry someone who your parents had planned could get your relatives killed by the rejected suitor's relatives. So you had to make the decision to resist your parents quite responsibly, realizing the, cat the catastrophe that could result from a refusal. However, once you're in a marriage, it was a ability you could get out of it. Uh, Viking women had the ability to request a divorce if a breakup of the marriage would prevent escalating violence in the family. And she had a right to receive back her dowry if there was a divorce. Uh, women did have the right to own and manage their own property and to make purchases relative to protecting that property in the Viking world. Um, they did have no right to be heard in the thing, the Norse representative assembly, but of course, you must keep in mind that women didn't have the right to do that in America until 1919 either. So we shouldn't be too critical of the Vikings for not allowing women to participate in the legislative process. That is a much, much later development in Western civilization. And women had to put up with the fact that their husbands owned female slaves and all the trouble that goes along with that. However, divorce, as I said, was allowed in East and Ireland. Divorce was allowed for physical cruelty that resulted in wounds or to prevent physical cruelty. And divorce was also allowed if your husband uh, was so indolent that he failed to raise enough money to support his own parents. And as a result, your spouse's parents became dependent on you. That was grounds for divorce in the Viking world. So let's take a look at that woman in front of you. Um, she's well familiar with the spindle because she's made the fabric for her own clothing. Uh, she's wearing there both a linen kirtle, the, under, the blue undergarment, which she wear both night and day for about a week, then you wash it. And then there's an overskirt, uh, which was used to keep your undergarment clean. Um, and that's, that's changed a little bit more often. The bronze brooches and gifts, they said, are bronze brooches and beads are gifts, of course, as a result uh, from her husband's successful raiding and trading, which ensures there's going to be a raid next year. Now, one of the objects that was brought back to Scandinavia from the raiding and trading um, was silver filigree jewelry. And here's a sample of that. A filigree is the use of fine silver wire in the creation of jewelry. And this was wildly popular in Scandinavia. It came to Scandinavia from trade with Byzantium, faraway Byzantium, which required crossing the rivers in Russia and Ukraine today to get down there and bring these things back. But this was such a popular style that it rapidly was adopted by the Vikings themselves uh, in the creation of objects in their own country. Here, for example, is a Christian crucifix uh, with the uh, filigree style the copy of one which is excavated at Birka. 
And here is a Thor's hammer, the, the symbol of the, of the pagan religion, for those who still follow it, once again, showing the filigree style. And this style of jewelry was so popular that it never went away. And today remains one of the features of the traditional Norwegian folkloric costume known as, well, I'll say that, now it's Meta's turn. So what uh, David was alluding to is the scenario of silversmithing has very, very long traditions coming from the Viking times and up to current times. And, you know, he does really well in pronouncing some of these uh, folkloric names, if you want to call it that, you know, Ia and Snorre, you know, are, are the names that we pronounce in uh, my native language. And I want to introduce myself. My name is Mette Maglid Bowen. I'm born and raised in Oslo, and I grew up across the bay from the peninsula where the Viking Ship Museum is today. And how many of you have been to Scandinavia? Wow, it's a good group of you. How many of you are Swedes? Whoa, you're in Geneva for one thing. You know, that makes sense. How about Danes? Oh, we got Danes. How about Norwegians? Oh, God. Um, I grew up in the capital of Oslo. And for those of you that might have visited Oslo, I went to nursery school in the park with all the nude statues. Okay, that was my playground growing up. I'm a city girl and came to the US as a young bride. Uh, Dave was talking about the, the Viking women did and textiles was always very important. He showed the spindle, but he needs a little tutorial to show you how that spindle actually works. But we'll forgive him for that. It is called a drop spindle. And you have a piece of wool and you attach one piece of that wool to the top of the spindle and you make it turn and not twirling it around like he's doing right now. <laughs> Um, so that you can create a piece of yarn. And that piece of yarn then becomes what you either weave with or not knitting, not crocheting. But the Vikings had a product that they called needle binding or null binning. And I'm usually not a kind of handicap when it comes to doing the different stuff. And there are many examples. Can this be zoomed in on? Um, needle binding. This is a very simple stitch. And for those of you who, I know that there's some here that do embroidery. What is used here is kind of like a blanket stitch. But there are many others that are much more intricate. Right? Some of them go by using your thumb. And this is not doing by using your thumb. This is wool. And you see, it's a kind of a short piece of wool and not like knitting or crocheting that we are used to today. It, you have to work with small, smaller pieces. And since we're running, I'm looking at the timer here. I was going to show you how to, because you have to splice a piece. Can you help me here in just a second? Uh, the this the splicing goes by taking another piece of wool and you take this one apart and you take it on and I was gonna and you use the Vikings use spit to join them together and you have the piece coming on and you roll them like this to make them fit together. And of course that becomes and as you look at this, it's kind of almost like laced, but it would also be felted in the aftermath. You use hot water and motion to make it felted and make it go together much more. So it, be it becomes, thank you. 
It becomes a piece you can use for socks, you can use for mittens, you can use for uh, and different things. Of course, weaving was part of what they did. And um, not to kind of, I took a class years and years ago, and this, truth be told, this was probably my only product. <laughs> <laughs> And this was a sampler. So it gives you uh, kind of an idea of things that they might have done. And it was an upright loom and not like we are used to today, but this is what a Viking loom would look like. And it has weights at the bottom to keep the warp tight, would push, the, you know, the thread that you shuttle in, the weft, up. And that's what they would make the cloth from. In the Ulsebarg uh, dig, they found a lot of very interesting textiles. Uh, they found silk and they found seeds. They found seeds that were hemp, for one thing. And hemp, of course, is what we call cannabis today which was used for making rope. And uh, the silk they know was not a product of Scandinavia. It must have come from as far away as what we today consider the Silk Road. Wool and linen was products that they had at home. Uh, the wool was the early sheep that they can think about was the predecessor to what we today call a sien sal, which is a, has a, a wool that's very glossy and has long fibers. And there are people in, in the US that have now are trying to raise the same kind of, it's been going on for some years and trying to raise the same kind of, of animal here because of its glossy and very nice quality. In the gray, they also found felted wool but they're not sure whether they actually felted the wool or if they took a piece of wool and put it in their footwear. And as a result of walking on it with the heat and the moisture from your body, that it felted itself. They, they did develop things to kind of make a nap on their garments. And this is probably the predecessor of our blankets today, the wool blankets. I'm going to just send this around. So as you can see, it's a woven fabric. And it, it kind of becomes that extra layer. And the reason for doing that, of course, is to trap air, which makes the garment warmer. And for the climate that it's, you know, they need the warmth. Um, they not use this. Some of you might be familiar with the Carter, but they didn't use this. In the grave, they found combs that they are pretty sure was used to kind of comb out the wool before they spun it. Uh, some of the story says that the Carters, this kind, probably had some evil spirits along with them so that they didn't use those. But, you know, for some of you that think that this might be going back that far, no, it wouldn't. They did, of course, have a lot of vessels to have food and storage and things like that in them. Well, I managed to break that one. We're going to come in. Can you hold on a second again? Um, this is called a tina, and it's made of birch bark. And this is a modern production. It's actually made by uh, some, a deceased close friend of mine who taught classes like this. And he also was part of a dig in Scotland that they wanted him to verify that the dig was actually a scenario. And 
because of his own research within the Norwegian archives, he knew it was a Viking settlement in Scotland. And he was an absolutely fantastic craftsman. Um, and so they needed a way to transport and keep their food. Uh, and food could have been, you know, some of you recognize this. This is Vasa. Of course, it's a very famous Swedish brand of what we call crackers. Well, I don't know if it's called some multigrain, and there's definitely some oats in here. And um, this is very likely something that has come in the early Viking ages with uh, unleavened bread. And it has continued. It lasts forever. Uh, you know, you keep it in a dry life, it lasts forever. And I'm seeing that she's looking at, you know, some, some of these things. And when he was talking about the jewelry, what I am wearing right now is more of a current Norwegian garb. And there are things here that are coming from the Viking era. This is wool. Of course, it's not hand woven anymore, but we call it tuskafta. It means that there's just one over, one under, one over, one under. So there's just two ways. There's not like a quill weave or anything like that. But this particular wool is that. It is all hand embroidered. And the shirt is linen. And this is what the tradition of the wool and the linen came from, from those days. There are jingles on my belt. <laughs> and there were jingles on some of the, the filigree things that they started with. There's jingles on my silver. So these are not necessarily filigrees. The top serbia and the bottom one. The little one was probably something that the girls got early on in their life. The, the bottom one was uh, a gift from my mother-in-law who was born and raised in Bellingham, Washington. Uh, she was all Norwegian, but as I said, born and raised in Bellingham, Washington. And her father was the, the way we can trace it to, to the ages was the Ministry of, Fisher, Ministry of Fisheries in the state of Washington. And before, as she knew she was dying of cancer, she sent me a box with jewelry that she had from her family because I was the Norwegian married into the family and she wanted me to have it because she also knew that she had a granddaughter that was Norwegian and we would appreciate it. Uh, that granddaughter, though she was raised in the US, she now lives in Norway. Um, and is very much into do nods and styles. And there was much more in that box that grandma gave me, but this one. But as grandma knew at that point in time, some of, most of that jewelry we passed on to her. And it has been. So, and she has two daughters. So we know it, and it, it's already being passed on to those two daughters. Um, this bunad is a bulgous bunad. There are specific ones for specific districts. And they sort of went out of style. They were in, remained in some areas, like Sertestal, Telemark, and Hardamir. But after the constitution was signed, 
in 1814, and the uh, kind of nationalistic feeling started coming about. There was a lady by the name of Hilda Godboy who started a folk dancing group, and she decided she needed to revive some of the bunas. And she went around and found pieces of embroidery and researched history. And one of the first uh, bunas that she recreated was kind of based on the howling doll embroidery. And many of them have the style that I'm wearing right now. And we call this a Hulda Godberg style of the cut. Um, I used to trade in bunas with imports, but never the festive bunas like this. It was all blue uh, bunas or cotton bunas, which were, I trusted the American public a little more with those than these. Because these have restrictions, and not that they're just totally boxed in, but there are things that you should follow if you're going to make one and wear one. And some of you already asked me if I embroidered this one. No, I didn't. Uh, I needed it for presentations uh, when I lived in Iowa many years ago and sent the letter to my father at that point in time and said, hey, I grew up in the city post-war and we didn't use bunas. That was used out in the country. And so dad said, okay, I'll find you one. Found this one and it was used and he sent it to me. And he said, I think it's from Gibran Stahl. Well, dad didn't know anything. He, he was a right man. I, I grew up in, behind the counter of a fabric store and my dad had two of them. So he knew textiles. That's why I call him a rag man. Um, but he didn't know anything about the nuts. Well, I opened it up and I put it on and it fit me. And I have had it for, I would say 45 years. I must admit it has gone in and out a couple of times. <laughs> and they are made with what we fondly call maturing tucks. The girls are typically given these for confirmation when they are done growing. And so they are there with the extra, you know, maybe the extra on the shoulder and the extra on the, you know, around the waist. And the pleated pleats and the skirt, of course, can be adjusted in and out. And so that you can see that there is room to grow and i just had a call from one of my close norwegian girlfriends and she said oh i don't fit into my boonad anymore can you help me well i have done stuff like that before so she uh so i said to her okay open it up first and see if there's enough fabric <laughs> and she can do that i haven't heard back from her yet but if we need to take it out uh, we can do that and if we take it in, we can need to, to do that too. Also in the Ulsebar grave, they found different kinds of looms. In Norwegian, we call it brikkeved. In the US, you, you here have, there are a couple of different, it's uh, tablet weed is one of them. Um, and it's little cards. And this kind of, of band or ornament is still used in many of the bunas today. These little cards, the ones that they, the one that they found in the Ulsberg grave had 52 cards. And that means how, the more cards, the wider the belt will be. And, or, or the trim or whatever. And this particular, if any of you have seen many bunas, no, that is that is not a card weave that you have, the braid that you have on your sweater. That's a different kind of weave. It's not a card weave. Um, 
and it's used as a telemark Bunas today with a wide, very wide belt. So many of these things that came from the Viking times still carry on in the in the Bunas that we use today. And at one count, I thought there were like 200 different versions. Um, they have gone back, done a lot more research. And from what I hear now, there's maybe as much as 400 different versions. My daughter just made a telemark buna for my younger granddaughter, where she researched it a lot and came up with a version that I think is very particular to Olea, my granddaughter. But mama did it, and it looks stunning. Uh, she was confirmed in September, and grandpa and I were happy to be there for her confirmation. Um, any of you have questions for either Dave or I? We're running kind of, at, I see it's one o'clock right now, but, uh, you know, we both have been kind of rattling on, both Dave and I. Um, are there any particular scenarios that you need clarification? I'm not a scholar. I, you know, I'm, I'm just a jack of all trades, I guess. But I grew up with doing a lot of handiwork. There isn't anything, much of anything that I can't reproduce with a sewing machine. And for my other older granddaughter, I did embroider her bring on. And for my own daughter, I didn't embroider it, but I constructed it. So, you know, and my daughter today is, she and her husband, as I said, they're in Norway, and uh, they are designers, furniture, interior. And just to be a little bragging mother, mother-in-law, the last exhibit for the Nobel Peace Prize for last year was the design of my children. Yeah. So uh, I, I'm a very proud mother. And they've done many museum exhibits, uh, the Munch Museum, the National Museum that just opened in Oslo, you know, in addition to doing other kinds of design work. So any questions from any of you? Yes. Norwegian. It'll 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 is Norwegian. Uh, the origination was probably in Telemark, which, you know, if you look at the jacket that I sent around, you can see kind of the same swirls in the embroidery as what you find in Rosamali. The Rosamali you know, died out, but the revitalization of Rosamali came in Stoughton, Wisconsin, where a guy by the name of Pierre Hisna, back in the 40s, I'm sorry, John quote me on times, you know, exactly. He started decorating kitchen cabinets. And so he kind of brought it back, and he was the one that brought it to the US in a, a large, larger format. Is that fairly new? Is it a new? No, it's a old technique. It is. It is, it goes, it goes way back. Uh, so no, but because of modernization and newer times and things like that. And in Norway, you, you I venture to say that I see more rules modeling stateside than I see in Norway, unless you go out and find some of the old places. A close girlfriend of mine, her mother inherited a farm in central Norway. And that was the time when I was in junior high school. And we went up, she took me up to the farm and there, it was what we call a kårstue, which is a home for the old people. So, you know, they didn't live, they couldn't participate and take care of the old, the farm anymore, but they still lived on the farm. And the decoration on the inside of it was absolutely spectacular. And that reminds me of another thing when he talked about, you know, that we think the females had to run the farm. We were the keeper of the keys. So the females had the keys. Who's through in, or the main missus, she was the keeper of the keys. And they were kind of given to daughter-in-law when she felt that she couldn't handle the task anymore. 
But if they wanted something, they had to talk to the missus. Yes. Well, that was part of the keys. So the stubborn was the food storage. And so, yes, that was part of everything. She had the control over all the larders and everywhere, whether that was food or mead, which is kind of a beer or whatever. She was the one in charge. You have an early fanny pack here on you? No, this is, you can maybe call it an early fanny pack. <laughs> Only thing I have in here is my chapstick. Uh -huh. But sometimes when I don't carry a purse, I stuff you know, my driver's license and a credit card and a couple of both of my keys in here. But today I didn't do that. You know, uh, things develop, and as far as, you know, the, the need is the mother of invention, right? So what the did all of their traditions of handiwork and so on was passed from grandma to mother to daughter. And some of that we have, we're kind of losing in today's economy and today's era. Uh, I, my mother taught me to use a sewing machine. Uh, she taught me how to knit. I was never very fond of crocheting. Um, I passed that on to my daughter. I don't know that I necessarily taught her how to knit, but she is an absolutely fantastic knitter today. Uh, and so was my mother. She would knit a sweater like that in a week. Um, and she provided them for all of us. And of course, before you leave, this is a museum. The Friends of the Viking Ship is also a sort of a museum of sorts. We rely upon you to keep us going. So any donations you can give to both organizations would be very much appreciated. Uh, I am sure that if you would, you know, leave a check here for the Viking Ship, that would be carried on or, you know, just make donations here. Uh, that's the way we all survive. And we appreciate being here today, and we thank you for coming.